Welcome all and welcome to my home and welcome to this time as we gather together to praise and adore and worship our God. I hope you and your family are enjoying a good week. I hope all is well with you. I pray for our gathered community as I anticipate this time of worshiping him with you. As we come together today, we're going to talk about worshiping and the worshiping community and how important our worshiping community is and should be to our places of living, our communities. I hope you'll join me there. Let's go to God in prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we thank you for each and every person that is tuned in with us today. And God, we do come to you humbly. We come to you with hearts that are filled with adoration and gratitude and expectation of God, how you will reveal yourself to us as we open up the pages of your word. Please meet us there, Lord God. We know that each time we do and we come with that eagerness and that yearning to be with you, that you just show yourself so beautiful to us. And we're grateful. Thank you, Father. Speak to our hearts, change us, shape us, use us, Lord God. Use us to speak your word of truth to those in our sphere of influence and make a Christ difference each and every day. We give you this time, Lord, we give you ourselves in worship in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. I'd like each of you to begin this time of worship with me with a little um, mental trip down the boulevard of Deland. Now, if there are those of you who are tuning in that um, are living in other communities and not here, think about where you live. Let's all of us think about that, that sort of main drag through town that takes us past all of the places that we enjoy, that we might frequent throughout the week. Um, just kind of have that mental picture, if you would, in your mind of, of just driving through your community and looking on both sides of the streets and down the side streets. And where are some of the places that you and your family go to throughout the week and enjoy? All those fun places and the things that, that just make family what it is and, and help you to enjoy your time together as family. What's important to you and yours as you think about your community? And now I want you to think with me, what if? What if it were all taken away? What if it were just gone and no longer a part of the landscape of your town? How would that particular void impact your life? We're gonna turn back time together and look at the Israelite nation at a season, a time in their history when they had lost everything, everything. They were in captivity in Babylon and all of Jerusalem, their homeland had been destroyed when Babylon came and took them over. Everything was gone. Their beloved temple their place of community, that, that place where they gathered as a people to learn about God and his ways, to worship him, to offer sacrifices to him. This was the place that defined their very lives, their purpose, their calling as the people of God. And it was gone. It was gone. Many years passed as they maintained this, this sense of captivity in Babylon but after many years, thanks to some political takeovers, which of course God himself engineered, the Israelites were released from Babylon. They were released and they were returning home to their beautiful Jerusalem. They couldn't wait to get there, not realizing just how decimated it had been, but the intent was to go back and to rebuild and to reestablish themselves and to make it their home yet again. And that's exactly what they did. And then 50 plus years pass, 50 plus years pass of these people being there back in Jerusalem and rebuilding. But in that time frame, the people kind of lost their way. They, they became lax in their worship of God and in their, their praying and their offering of sacrifices. They'd become somewhat spiritually bankrupt through all of this, sadly, sadly. That was the state of Jerusalem and the very people of God. They needed a jump start. 
They needed a, a revival. They needed somebody to light a fire under them spiritually. And that somebody was Ezra the priest. Ezra the priest was there in Babylon, and he was also sent away from Babylon after all this time to go back to Jerusalem and to get this job of reviving the people, to get it done. And you know what's remarkable? Is he got the very blessing from the political leadership in Babylon to do exactly just that. And that's where we pick up the scripture today. We're going to look in the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 7, and we'll begin with the 20th verse there. So please turn there in your Bibles, turn there on your scriptures, uh, on your devices, wherever it is that you study the scriptures. Ezra chapter 7, we'll begin at the 20th verse and read through verse 24. Follow along with me if you would, please. And there we begin hearing the words of the king of Babylon himself. He says, And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which you are responsible for providing, you may provide out of the king's treasury. I, King Artaxerxes, decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river, Whatever the priest Ezra, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, requires of you, let it be done with all diligence, up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and unlimited salt. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal. For the house of the God of heaven, or wrath will come upon the realm of the king and his heirs. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute, custom, or toll on any of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or the other servants of this house of God. Wow. Just imagine here is Ezra, prepared to go to Jerusalem to do this very important calling, this mission of God, to help the people come back to where they need to be in serving and worshiping and praising God and living in community in a way that they are just the center and the vital most place of gathering for all of Jerusalem. And he goes, and he goes with the blessing of the king. The king says, listen, whatever is required, whatever you need to get this whole business of worshiping and offering and getting everything in the temple set back to where it needs to be, whatever you need, it's on my tab, he says. I got this. I'll take care of it for you. Then the king speaks and addresses all of the accountants there in Babylon. He says, listen, don't you guys be messing with Ezra. Don't you be touching Ezra. Whatever he needs, whatever it is that he needs, that God tells him that he needs to reestablish everything that needs to be done back in Jerusalem, back in his home, you let it be done. And you let it be done well with excellence. You take care of it right away. Don't put it off. Do it right away. Let it be a priority to you. And yeah, there'll be some limits on what it is that we will supply him, but whatever it is that he asks for, you take care of it. You make sure that this job gets done and you do it with zeal, with fervor, with excitement, with enthusiasm. We are a part of what is going to take place there in Jerusalem. And he says, and oh, by the way, don't even give it a thought. Don't even give it a thought that perhaps you can slap some sort of tax or fine or some sort of toll on Ezra or any of the uh, other people, the worshiping community, the singers, the, the, the praise team, if you will, that he is going to escort back to Jerusalem. Uh -uh. We're not doing any of that either. No, no, no. We support this totally and completely. We are behind all that God is doing and will continue to do in his temple in Jerusalem. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? It's incredible. Just think with me. I wonder if something happened here. Something happened here within our worshiping community. Something that somehow 
compromised our ability to be able to worship God in the same ways that we had before. And I'm thinking something practical, something to happen to our building, or we needed something in particular in order to make and enhance the worship of God here amongst our family of faith. Do you think, do you think that our mayor or our city manager or our city council would just come running to us and handing us some sort of easy permit to take care of whatever would need to be taken care of. Oh, and then they would say, oh, we've got supplies. Whatever supplies you need, give us your list and we'll take care of that. Oh, and by the way, you've got our full support and our full backing. And if anyone, anyone attempts to kind of get in the way, we'll take care of that. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. We will prevent anyone from standing in the way of restoring worship right here in your worshiping community. Hmm. We've got some great government officials here in our community, but I wonder if that's where they would be if we truly were in a situation like that. Perhaps a better question that we need to ask of ourselves is this. How vital are we right here to the city of Deland. How vital, how important are we, the worshiping family of faith in our community, to our community of Deland? If for any reason we were what was gone, when you take that mental picture of the community, that mental drive through town, what if, if we were the ones that were gone, what would be the impact upon our city? And I'm not talking about how would it impact us as we gather together, whether in person or virtually, and enjoy our time together and enjoy our friendships and enjoy the things that, that we are privileged and humbled to do in serving God. I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about the people in the greater community outside of our church. How would our being gone impact and affect their lives. And I wonder how that would compare to, say, one or multiple of the civic groups in our community who are vital to us, who we love so much and we have so much fun with them and they do such great things. If they were gone versus us being gone, how would that compare? What about our community center? The Sanborn Center was, was built not too long ago and has become quite the, the wonderful place for gathering. If it were suddenly not there any longer, how would that void compare to the void of our worshiping community being gone? Or, or your, your favorite restaurant in town or the, the shops that you like to browse through and buy from? What if any of those things were gone? How would it compare to us being gone? You get the picture, right? Where do, do we, God's church, his church, where do we fit into the grand scheme of vitality to our community right here? We should be crucial. We should be cherished. We should be a needed part of our community not because of where we're located, you know, or right there on the boulevard, right at the, the north end of town, not because, oh, look at that big, beautiful church, not because of, oh, have you been inside? Oh, those, those tall ceilings and the rafters and the, the pipe organ and all those things. It is just absolutely gorgeous. Not because of the looks, not because of the location, not because, oh, they've been here 140 years. Isn't that incredible? Not because we've been here forever and ever or that we helped uh, initiate years and years, decades ago, uh, Stetson University's beginnings. No, but instead, we should be crucial because we here today, right now, are relevant, crucially relevant to the life of our community. <laughs> we, his church, God's church, that's a heavy responsibility. We're accountable. We're accountable to God for how it is that we have managed 
his resources, the very resources he's given us over these decades to build and establish and maintain his church and our vitality in this community. We're accountable to God for that. We're accountable to God for how it is that we have loved each other within this family of faith. We're accountable to God for how we've loved our community. The people who aren't worshiping with us, but who live down the street from us, who live across the street from our church, who we work with, who we go to school with, we're accountable to God for how we've loved them. We're accountable to God for how we've served them. We're accountable to God for how we have demonstrated to them the very, very love of Jesus Christ. And we're accountable to God as his worshiping community, his family of faith right here, for how we have faithfully fulfilled his call and his mission here, empowered by the Holy Spirit, directed by his Holy Spirit, but to be Christ-like change agents in, right in the heart of our very community. We're accountable. When we are living authentically as his church, exactly as he has created us to live and to be and to praise and worship and serve in our community, when we are living authentically as God's church, there is nothing that can stand in the way of what God will do in and through his church. Because nobody messes with God's church. Nobody messes with his church. They weren't able to mess with the church in Jerusalem. The king saw to it that Ezra had the red carpet rolled out for him to go do what it is that God had called him to do. Nobody messed with that church, and they won't mess with God's church here either. Don't you be trying to mess with God's real church. I love how Jesus said he would build his church, and he does, doesn't he? He builds his church. No matter how much we think we might, it's not us, it's him. I love how Pastor Jim Cimbala said it. He said it this way. Jesus said that he was building a church and that he was leaving, but he was leaving the Holy Spirit in charge of his church. Not the pastor, not the board, not clever people, not new software, not corporate America thinking, not talented musicians. No, the Holy Spirit is who Jesus left in charge of his church. Wow. You know, if we seem to think somehow that we've got it all figured out and that we can kind of get it all wrapped up and taken care of, this, this thing of being church, this, this mission of being church, if we think we can do it all on our own, then do we even really need him? Do we act as though, do we live as though we don't even need the Holy Spirit. You see, I personally believe that God's true church, the real deal God's church, is completely dependent upon him. I believe that God's true church knows, knows with complete certainty that they are absolutely dependent upon him. And I believe that God's genuine church thrives, thrives in the fact that they know they cannot do anything, anything at all outside of their complete dependence upon him. Hmm. Now, of course, there are people within the church that come to the worshiping fellowship with all sorts of resources. They have lots of wisdom. Many have influence within the community. They have gifts that God has given them. They have got talents. They've got capabilities. But you know, his church, God's true church, knows that God was the one that put those very 
people there. He is building his church and he put the right people in the right places. And he is the one that gave them those resources. He's the one that gave them that wisdom. He is the one that gave them their influence. He gave them those gifts, the talents, and the capabilities. You see, friends, God's not interested in building some sort of imposter church, a church that's not Holy Spirit-led, a church that doesn't truly need Him to function as a church. And there are plenty of churches out there that, that act as though they don't, that are very, very professional and, and do great church work in excellence, but without the empowerment and the leading and the undergirding and, and the everything, the total dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case, then why wouldn't God just leave that sort of imposter church to its own ways and its own resources? You know, the devil just loves when we do church and we think we've got church all figured out. And we just stay real, real busy doing all sorts of church work. And we talk this great talk about God, but we don't live in his power. We live and we love all on our own. Oh, the devil just loves it. Think with me in, in these next few moments about how it is that we can be real, true God church the absolute kind of church that's so vitally important within our community. You know, as a church, we're a people of prayer. And Jesus talked about it, that we are to be a house of prayer. And I believe that that's not just simply we open up any kind of gathering that we have with a word of prayer and we close it back with a word of prayer. I believe that what that means is that we are a people who knows that we can't make a decision. We can't do anything without absolutely bathing it all, wrapping it all up tight in prayer. And we just don't simply go to God at, at slated times and give him our list and we say, here's all the sick people and here's all the needs of our church and here's some needs in our community and here's some things that concern our hearts about our world. I think as far as being God's real church and a real true people of prayer, we've got to get on our knees and get on our faces. And I mean continually, fervently, just passionately praying to God, pleading with God to intervene into our lives, to intervene into our world, to be a part of all that is going on. Let us see and know and feel his very presence. And then we've got to go to him in prayer, praising and adoring him for all that he is to us and all that he has done for us. I think there's so much more to prayer than just simply checking it off the list in our order of service. But instead, that it is a lifestyle. It is a way in which we know we are connected to our Heavenly Father, our Almighty God. And the same for worship. We can come to worship and we can come running in, running in late. We can be all frazzled, whether that means we're, we're tuning in the computer or we're coming into in person, however and wherever it is that we worship. I, I, I've, I've invited you so many times when we have come to our time of video worship to, to put aside all the distractions, cut the TV off. Don't be ironing while you're trying to, to, to worship or, or washing the dishes or any of the household chores. Let your focus be completely to God. And the same for in-person gatherings. Be prayed up. Be filled up. Begin worshiping long before we ever gather together, wherever, whenever, however that gathering might be. Already be consumed with worship and then let the gathering just, just escalate that sense of worship even more. A real, true, sincere, genuine church of God has an intimate relationship with him. It's not just acknowledging that he is God and this higher power that, that we, we say we surrender ourselves to his lordship. No, we mean it. 
we really do give our total lives over to him. Whatever he calls us to do, however, whenever, we are his and we are fully his, whatever he needs. I believe that God's real and true and authentic church is one that has an intimate relationship with him. It's not just a group of people that, that sense this, this higher being, this grander God, this, this, this higher presence amongst themselves, but a people that find themselves absolutely surrendered to his lordship, absolutely given of themselves to whatever he calls us to do, whenever, however, whyever, even when we don't completely see the whole picture or completely understand. We know that he is God and he is our father and we truly trust him as individuals, as family, as a church family. I believe that a real and true God church is one that is Holy Spirit empowered. We recognize that despite the fact that of course we come to a worship gathering with with thoughts and plans and we've prepared. We, We've done our job to do what it is we need to do to, to, to lead in worship and to be a worshiping community together. But we also understand that the Holy Spirit is who is in charge. And the Holy Spirit can, can detour us from our plans and take on his own at any given time he so desires. And we recognize that it all means absolutely nothing without the presence of the Spirit within us and within our gathered community. A true and absolute church of God recognizes and understands that our relationships with other people are so critically, critically important. Not just with fellow believers, fellow worshipers, but with all people, particularly those who don't yet know Christ or who have not surrendered their lives to him. We need to be in relationship with people who live differently, who perhaps are living in very dark places or just have yet to, to open their hearts and minds to God. They just turned their backs on him. We need to be in relationship with them in ways that they can see Jesus Christ in us and to see that there's so much a better way. That's God's true church, isn't it? God's true church is a bold change agent in the community, one who is right there for the people in this community that is, in fact, cherished and vital and significant in the very communities in which we live. We, we harbor his kingdom living amongst ourselves, and that's completely countercultural to the way the rest of the world lives. And they see that. They recognize that. They see that we do, in fact, live as a community, as a people, and we live differently than perhaps so much of the world around them does, and that, that we are a people, a people of, of astounding faith that when it seems impossible, we believe God has called us to it. Therefore, we take those bold steps of faith that the community needs to see that in us. And I believe that's who God's real church is when they see just that. They see that projects that go on around the church, that they're not just practical. Of course, you know, you got to do those practical things to keep up the property itself naturally, but that there's spiritual significance to everything. Thing that takes place amongst the people of God. I believe that his true, true church believes beyond, beyond all that we are to reach people, that our greater purpose, our greater mission and calling is to help other people know who God is, to surrender their lives to him, to become disciples of his as we are, and to grow, to grow his kingdom, not just for us to, to gather and have great friendships and good fellowships and eat good food and enjoy singing some great songs together and, and listening to his word proclaimed and praying together. No, no, no. We are to be a people who says we have got to bring others who are not here into the family. That's what God has called us to do. I love how the king told his people, he says, you do whatever Ezra tells you to do, and you do so with zeal. You do so with passion and fervor, enthusiasm, with some intensity. And I would ask myself that very question, and I hope you will do the same. Do we truly engage as his church? Whatever it is that he's called us to do and how it is that he's called us to be, do we do so in his church and in his community with this kind of zeal and excitement and enthusiasm. 
Do you come to this gathering of worship excited and thrilled and ah, I'm so looking forward to how God will speak to me? Or do you come thinking, oh my gosh, I'm just so tired. Uh, I hope I can stay awake through all of this. Or if you're one who gathers in person, do you come running in, just you know, running late and you just couldn't get it all going this morning and oh, you're so tired and it's got such a busy afternoon ahead and you know, there's a ball game and there's this and there's that and you're looking around and who's wearing what? And Or do we come into the very presence of God as a people, as a community, as his church with excitement and zeal to be together, but to be together, worshiping together, praying together, studying together, growing and learning and living together in the very powerful and just awe-inspiring presence of God himself, the power of his Holy Spirit. Are we a people of zeal? I think about the very wonder of God, the very wonder of God. And I think when we are truly living and worshiping and serving as his church, that's when we see his wonder amongst us. Those things that, that are just astounding and incredible and we can hardly even begin to think about explaining them. Where he won't just merely care for us and, and answer a few of our prayers along the way or just simply allow us to enjoy a, a pleasing church experience and kind of feel good about being in worship together. I believe God will do even more, even more. I do believe, I firmly believe that as we are living out as his true and real and genuine church, dependent upon him, dependent upon his Holy Spirit, clearly surrendered to his leadership in his church, I believe that he will bring our community to understand how vital we are to them. Not because of who we ourselves, but because of God in us and how important the community of God is to the greater communities in which we live. I believe that the community will come to, to sacrifice for us, to give to us, to help us out. I really, truly do. Because they know how crucial, how crucial we are his church are to their, their home and their community. You know, I love it. I just love it when our community turns to us and, and they look to us as a, as, a, as a church, as God's church, and they long to, to, to have family, um, family festivities, family important seasons in their life, marriages there. They've held funerals in our church facility before. We've seen our local high school come, our, our, the university next door, and hold events and activities there. And they see us as a partner in what it is that they do. They see us as important to, to what it is that they do. That means so very much to me when we're able to actually share what it is that God has blessed us with. It's his anyway. And to do so with those people in our community, I just absolutely love it when that happens within our church. We need to be vital to our community, and I want even more. And I think there's so much, much more for us to be in our community in ways that God will just show his goodness and where the community will step up and desire to partner with us and to be vital to us just as we desire to be vital to them. We need to be, we need to be relevant to all that takes place in our community. Isn't that what you want to be a part of? Isn't that what you really want to commit yourself to? I mean, what kind of church do you really want to be? I hope that you will join me um, as we continue uh, growing and, and thriving as God's church in this community. I hope you'll continue um, to join with me as we seek to be a deeper embodiment of God's church in this community. I don't want people to drive by our place and say, oh, look, there's that nice church. Yeah, that's great. That's real pretty. No, I want them to drive by and recognize just how important God's presence is 
not just in that church, not just in us, his church, but in their community. I want them to recognize that there is something amazing and powerful that takes place there, something that kind of defies their reason and their logic, something that they can't explain. We can because we know it's God. It's not us. It's him. And that's what I desire. I desire that you be a part of this with me. I hope that together as family that we can just find ourselves in a season of praying and pleading with God to show us ways that he will take us deeper in relationship to him, that he will take us deeper in our faithfulness to his call, and that he will help us, direct us, equip and empower us and lead us to step boldly with zeal, excitement into our community in ways that the community sees the presence of Christ and sees an influence from Christ. They see change because they've seen him in and through us. Let's be all that he calls us to be. Let's do so such that we see this community changed, not for our applause or for our accolades, no, 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 but for God's greatness, for the honor that is due to God and to God alone, so that his name will be proclaimed and acclaimed throughout this community and beyond. Please, won't you join me? Let's pray together. Loving Father, we do desire to be all that you've created us to be. We do so much desire, God, to just simply be faithful to the very calling that you've placed upon us. Don't let us get caught up in being routine and in the activities of church, but to always, always cherish the power of your presence there in the building, uh, upon us as your worshiping community, but upon us as individuals, your children, God. Use us, strengthen us, make us, Lord God, the kind of people that you need us to be, I pray that the enemy recognizes that he's got a formidable opponent in us, not because of who we are, but because of whose we are, because you are in and through us. I pray that this community, our community, sits up and takes notice that there is something mighty powerful taking place amongst that group of people, and that they see that it's not because of anything that they can explain in worldly understanding or terms, but instead it is only through your goodness, your power, and your very, very amazing, amazing presence in us. God, we give ourselves to you. Use us, we pray, to your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.